Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I may have your attention, please. I'm Bob Wood, the uh, Executive Vice President of AFCEA International, and on behalf of USNI and AFCEA, I'd like to welcome you to our afternoon panel session. Hope you made your way through the uh, ice cream successfully, made it here in time. Really appreciate your attention and being with us today as we address a very important topic. A reminder, if you've got your uh, phones with you, if you put it on stun and and uh, by the way, check that West app out. There's still more information coming. There's still more program to be had. So take a look at that. Uh, we will be uh, asking questions uh, of the speaker and the panel today with the microphones you see spotted here in the audience. Just uh, queue up and uh, you'll be recognized by our moderator. We are indeed going to talk about uh, a subject that's very important when you listen to uh, Admiral Davidson's uh, presentation, and he talked about the, the networking of the training ranges. He talked about the necess necessity for multi-domain command and control and the kind of coordination that demands. And frankly, gave us a history lesson on how this evolution has brought us to where we are in a very important part of his world and our world. So this should be a great uh, discussion. We've got a wonderful set of leaders. I'd invite them now to please come on up and we'll uh, uh, a correction so after we have a presentation, one thing to do before we bring them up on stage, and that is an opportunity for uh, Rear Admiral Boris Becker to uh, present a special presentation for the winners of the NAVWAR Prize Challenge that was seeking innovative machine learning and artificial intelligence solutions for real world cybersecurity challenges. Admiral Becker, may I invite you to the stage? Well, good afternoon. Uh, how many of you are familiar with what a prize challenge is? All right, about a good group of you. It's a way to go faster, uh, and that's what we got to do, right? We got we got to figure out how to go faster. If you were here for the uh, Syscom panel, you know, I told you that we we told you today, we told you last year, year before that. Well, this is one of the ways where we're trying to speed things up uh, with a prize challenge that we announced in the fall, and in less than six months, some of that was just a lag. Uh, that we could have gone a bit faster, but less than six months, we went from a great idea released into the wild uh, to down selecting to two winners that we'll uh, announce today. Uh, the prize challenge was this, how to take machine learning and apply artificial intelligence to volumes of data to create endpoint security. Because we need endpoint security on every single ship and station, every place we got an endpoint, we need endpoint security especially if we can't connect to the, the cloud and other aspects of uh, providing security. So how can we do that? How can we apply machine learning and AI to endpoint security? We had a great team. Uh, Oak Ridge National Labs is here. Uh, they, uh, they assembled a set of data. Uh, I think the technical term is gross ton. Um, and they ran it. Looks like guys are still on lunch break here. Uh, they ran it through their uh, super hypercomputers and all that good stuff, uh, ran it against all sorts of files that might be out there in the wild, and maybe the systems that we were checking didn't know what they were looking for. Uh, and we learned an awful lot. We learned an awful lot. And today, I'm proud to let you learn who our second place winner is. Will Elastic please come to the stage? Mr. Kevin Kluge.
I'm announcing today the next prize challenge, the follow-on for $500,000, half a million dollars. <laughs> now we want to take this, what we've learned here on how to apply uh, AI and machine learning um, and add it to our, our capabilities for going beyond endpoint protection. Uh, it's going to be exciting, it's going to be fast, and I look forward to the next time I get to present one of those big giant checks, because that's actually a lot of fun. Uh, all right, thanks very much. I'm out. You've got a great panel ahead of you. Thank you. Okay, what a great uh, opportunity to recognize some excellence in some key areas. We're now inviting our panel to the stage. Let's give our awardees another hand, please. Okay, next uh, what I'd like to do is introduce this panel and start with the moderator and allow him to make introductions of his panel. Um, it's pretty easy to do, he's my boss, um, happily so. He is uh, a remarkable uh, leader, a man that uh, has led uh, Marine Corps signal and communicators for a long time, acted in the Joint Force for a variety of positions. Uh, act actually as well came to his position as uh, Chief Executive Officer of AFC International uh, from his position as the exec Executive Vice President uh, Strategic Solutions for Smartronics certainly has a good feel what's going on out here on the floor and what our business uh, members are interested in. He was the commander of a variety of communication commands and also director at the joint level, uh, at the joint chiefs of staff level, and uh, is frankly uh, a great leader in his communication skill and his communication background. But I'm telling you, just looking at it from the AFCA perspective, uh, he has absolutely transformed AFCA International and AFCA members and chapters into a strong, agile, and committed AFC organization. A great, great job in that. I'm proud to introduce him and allow him to lead a great panel. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome General Robert Shea. Thank you, Bob. I don't want you out there, standing out there, to get sore feet, so please come on in and sit down uh, and, and listen to what we've got to pass on here today. But today's panel is uh, C5 ISR readiness, are ready now and in the future. Um, and we've got a panel here of, this, this group here probably has more experience in this world, or in this area, than any other panel that uh, I've been around. And I, I don't mean that in a derogatory nature, in case you're thinking about You call them as old. Uh, <laughs> but the bottom line, there's a lot of experience here on this, it, it, sitting at this table to represent that. And uh, I think they can get into this topic pretty, uh, you know, from a, from a capabilities perspective, from a thought leadership perspective, uh, to the level that will be really important and, and provide you good takeaways as you leave here. To my immediate left is Rear Admiral Dave Dermanlian. He serves the Assistant Commandant for C4IT for the Coast Guard. And he was dual head as the commander of the Coast Guard Cyber Command, uh, CG6. He served as a director of training and exercises for the United States Cyber Command, so he's certainly fully aware of, of that uh, cyber aspect of what's going on. And he's developed joint training assessment standards and orchestrated those over a large scale exercises. Um, he's also been the command, uh, commander of command and control communi communications computer and in information technology with the Coast Guard's I, uh, C4IT service center. Next to him is Vice Admiral Matt Kohler. Matt is the N2, N6 of the Navy. He's a professional Navy intelligence officer. Uh, the thing that really strikes me when you look at Matt, he's had a lot of joint experience. Uh, he's been at Special Operations Command, the Joint Interagency Task Force South. Um, he's, he's had key positions and uh, combat leader positions as the Information Warfare Officer since his promotion to Admiral. Uh, to include the Director of Intelligence uh, for the United, or the Naval Intelligence for the United States Navy. So Matt has got, not only does he bring intelligence perspective, but he brings a cyber expertise with him as well. So again, we've got a gentleman here that really knows his profession and, uh, and he, we're glad to have him on this panel today. And next to him is Vice Admiral Nancy Norton from the Defense, she is the Director of the Defense Information Systems Agency. She's well known to this audience, as is Admiral Kohler. 
She's also the commander of the Joint Force Headquarters for the Department of Defense Information Network. Uh, she, and her job, she's got the big job, I think, that everybody recognizes. She's the one that really provides the backbone, for lack of a better term. She's the, uh, the commercial provider, she's kind of the equivalent of a commercial provider for services across the Department of Defense in support of the Joint Chiefs Staff, the combatant commanders, as well as all components. Not only that, but she's also served as a direct command and control communications director at the United States Pacific Command. And most recently, she served as the vice director for the Defense Information Systems Agency. So we're certainly pleased to have her on this panel as well. And next to her is Lieutenant General Lori Reynolds. Lori has commanded uh, at, at just about every level in the Marine Corps. Uh, she commanded 9th Com Battalion in 2003 and deployed the battalion to Fallujah in support of 1MEF during Operation Iraqi Freedom. She commanded 1MEF Headquarters Group in 2009 and deployed that group to Helmand Province, Afghanistan in support of 1MEF and RC Southwest during Operation Enduring Freedom. In addition to that, she, is, she commanded the Marine Corps Recruit Depot at Paris Island, South Carolina, and we all know that's a legend, right? Um, as she was also in charge of the Eastern Recruiting re uh, Region. She served as a principal deputy to the Assistant Secretary of Defense for South and Southeast Asia, and she commanded Marine Corps Forces Cyberspace Command uh, for three years from 2015 to 2018. What I'm gonna do to start this thing off, I'm gonna ask each one of the panels to give just a few minutes here, talk a little bit about the challenges they see as the, you know, from a readiness perspective now and, and maybe a glimpse into the future. We'll get into a little bit more of that later on. Um, but to give you a, just kind of a perspective and a scene setter so we can get into the discussions. After that, I'm gonna throw out a couple questions for them to talk about, and then I would invite the audience here to come up and bring your questions forward. Here's an opportunity to talk to the people who are dealing with this problem right now, and I think uh, there's been a lot of focus uh, and, and a lot of interest in certainly the multi-domain, all-domain operations, you're hearing about that. They have to work in that environment, and they're responsible for that, many parts of that do environment in their respective services. Um, in addition uh, to you know, what, what you see uh, uh, from an IT perspective. So I'm gonna open up to Admir Admiral uh, Dermanlian and, and let him start off. Uh, thank you, sir. And I'd like to just thank FCA and the U.S. Naval Institute for the opportunity to chat. Um, clearly, I'm up here to make the others look uh, better. Um, and so, no oh, bar. Yeah, well, just, uh, just saying, sir, I think the audience is asleep, by the way. Um, so, <laughs> so last week, I uh, had the opportunity to see our uh, the Coast Guard Service Secretary, Acting Secretary uh, Chad Wolf, at the National... Uh, Reagan National Airport, Hangar 6, uh, who recognized uh, out, of his, uh, out of his speech, uh, talked about the Coast Guard's uh, readiness as a departmental priority. So readiness is on not only on the Commandant's mind, uh, Admiral Schultz, it's on the uh, Department of Homeland Security's uh, radar as well, which is huge. Uh, normally you don't hear the term readiness and priority coming out of uh, coming out of the department from, from my perspective. Um, so that was great to hear. Um, and so I'm gonna start out with just the notion of readiness. You know, from a dirt farmer perspective, Michigan dirt farmer, you know, the, the notion of, of readiness, what is it, what's that definition look and feel like? Uh, from my perspective, it's uh, be, because the Coast Guard is always operating, we're bringing mission day in, day out, 365 to, to the nation. Uh, our readiness is, is really directly linked to the ability to exchange information in a, in a DIL environment, in a denied, degraded, intermittent, limited uh, bandwidth environment. So if we're, if we're able to exchange, deliver, um, and, and serve up information, um, that's a pretty good measure of, of what readiness means to us. So um, I think it was on yesterday, uh, both... Uh, Admiral Schultz and Admiral Fagan talked about um, our Coast Guard Cutter uh, Polar Stars coming back from the uh, Antarctic. Uh, the Polar Star was operating in a DIL environment. Uh, once they got uh, south of 70 degrees south, uh, there was not much in terms of connectivity. Uh, they had challenges uh, uh, throughout their deployment uh, keeping connected and keeping that 
the readiness of their, of their mission, breaking 17, 18 miles of ice uh, to get to McMurdo to be able to resupply that, that, uh, that strategic out, outpost. Um, so our readiness is measured almost on a daily basis based on the feedback that I'm getting on operational summaries, uh, sit reps, patrol summaries. I'm getting that, that, that readiness feedback on how our C5I capabilities are, are delivering uh, information and that those commanders that are at sea are able to uh, uh, send and receive information. So, Okay, thank you. Matt, Admiral Kohler. Well, uh, thanks and good afternoon, everyone here. Uh, after lunch, we're in a, uh, in a great spot. So first of all, uh, I did not get uh, a stop at the ice cream, whatever that reference was early, and I was rushed out of the executive suite to get <laughs> over here, so I feel shortchanged. <laughs> Um, and I'm looking for Boris Becker. So there he is. So as the N2 and 6 resource sponsor for all of information warfare, I thought I was the guy that wrote the checks. Um, so I'm kind of paying attention and taking notes about uh, how much those checks are for and where they're coming from. So uh, yeah, you're welcome. There's not more where that came from. Um, uh, uh, thanks, Bob. Uh, thanks to you for uh, for hosting us here this afternoon, and thanks for all you've done for FCF. Well, thank you. Uh, it's not me. I got a great team. Believe me. Well, it's it's uh, it's been uh, an amazing run here. I had to make these comments when we opened up the IW Pavilion yesterday. A 30-year run, and I don't know how they how you make these events uh, improve each year on end, but you do. Uh, and this has the, been the best one that I've seen. Every speaking event, every panel, there's just there's just been um, a tremendous experience here. So so thanks for that. But I, um, in, in all uh, kidding aside, I think we look forward to this privilege here of almost like a cleanup batter position from a good day, two days run with some really great speakers, uh, having the sea service chiefs in a, in a different spot. Normally they're into the second day, at least my experiences here in the past, and having them right out of the gate on the first morning, uh, I think really set the tone for all of us uh, and some of the challenges that we face. And then most recently here with, with Admiral Davidson, uh, with a, a pretty clear eyed view of what uh, lies in, in front of us. Um, in all of those discussions, you can clearly pull out the kind of capabilities, the power of information, uh, the necessity to be able to deliver uh, that information advantage, uh, whether we find ourselves in a full-up kinetic engagement uh, or in a more day-to-day -day type of operations, what we provide is critical. Uh, there's lots we can talk about in terms of the C5I ISR, which covers a really wide swath. Uh, it fits comfortably in, at least certainly where the Navy fits, where we describe information warfare that covers all of that, from an intelligence to our cyber to IT to space and the meteorology and oceanographic pieces, because uh, it is all about the information. But specifically, right out of the gate, I'll just say to the questions, um, are we ready uh, now, and uh, are we ready for the future? Um, I feel, if anyone says that they feel comfortable in this business, I think is, uh, don't know, doesn't know the business, or is lying to you. Um, but in terms of what we have now, and able to meet their challenges, uh, while we are challenged across the spectrum, I still believe we have the best C5 ISR capability to deliver a global capability to our forces that are deployed. Uh, it doesn't come without challenges. We heard the Don CIO uh, in his discussions yesterday. Certainly we are challenged in terms of meeting that. But for today, uh, I think we are answering all bells. Uh, the challenge we have is when we look to ad address the question of into the future. Um, that is a fast moving train uh, and nobody should feel comfortable in that. Uh, there's nothing that stops us from being ready for that in the future. We just have our challenges. Uh, I'll leave it at that uh, and uh, leave it for some follow-on discussions to go into some greater detail. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. And next to uh, Admiral Kohler, we have Admiral Norton. Well, thank you, General Shea. I really appreciate uh, being up here today. Thank you again for putting on a great show. Um, what, uh, what FCA and the U.S. Naval Institute do to support our mission and our workforce is really tremendous and, and uh, really do uh, echo Admiral Kohler's comments about a great show. 
Um, so, uh, you know, a couple of things that I want to talk about. One, um, the, the DISA, the Defense Information Systems Agency. I am dual-hatted, but I'll talk first about DISA. And we are very much aligned to support the national defense strategy and, uh, and the rise of great power competition uh, to strengthen alliances and, and build new partnerships, to reform the, the business and the government and in uh, innovation and modernization, and most importantly, uh, to restore military readiness as we build a more lethal force. And def uh, DISA, as a IT combat support agency, is, um, is aligned to do exactly that. The DISA strategic plan has three primary goals, to operate and defend our systems, to adopt, buy, and create solutions that meet our warfighters and business needs, and to enable our people and reform the agency. Uh, DISA was established about 60 years ago, just almost 60 years ago, as the Defense Communications Agency to create an integrated telecommunications system that will economically, efficiently, and effectively satisfy national defense requirements. That's a quote. And that really hasn't changed in 60 years now. We provide the Enterprise C5 ISR capabilities that span the globe, that span terrestrial, SATCOM, and mobility, and support all of the, the Defense Department and many others in the government. As the commander of the Joint Force Headquarters, Doden, uh, we, uh, we have a, a, a mission to um, synchronize the operational effectiveness of 45 DOD components to secure our networks, reduce vulnerabilities, operate our systems effectively, and defeat, deny, and disrupt attacks against the Department of Defense Information Networks, or the Doden. But don't think of the Doden as just the traditional IT networks it is a lot more than that. It's all the classification levels of IT systems as well as the newer IT systems like mobility and cloud, plus our programs of record, our platform IT, our weapon systems IT, ICS SCADA, and the growing field of Internet of Things devices. And so when we think about readiness in across the Doden, uh, it's all about how do we achieve the secure, operate, and defend mission from the collective readiness of those 45 DOD components, all synchronized to respond and, and defeat our adversaries in the cyber, cyber domain. And that's from our maneuver force, so the combat, uh, the, the, uh, the cyber protection teams, and our red teams, <coughs> and all of the static cyber forces, whether that's the system administrators, the cybersecurity professionals, or uh, our help desk operators, and our developers. So all of that collectively has to come into play when we think about what the cyber readiness is for, for the DOD. Uh, it also comes from the large-scale enterprise efforts that we at DISA have developed and executed at the endpoints and the boundaries, providing tools for each of the DOD components to use to increase their cybersecurity capabilities and uh, defend their portion of the Doden and increase our collective shared cyber situational awareness. So we're taking very much a, a, a command-centric approach to that work, which means that each commander in all of those DOD components have to be responsible for uh, understanding what their terrain is and their priorities. And we're working to further um, increase the, the understanding of a threat-informed prioritization of our efforts across the Doden. So between uh, DISA and Joint Force Headquarters Doden, the 16,000 or so people that work around the globe uh, are working to increase our readiness every day. Are we ready now? Absolutely. We execute our mission day in and day out. We assure the missions of every combatant command around the world, ready for great power competition every day. The synergy between DISA and Joint Force Headquarters Doden works very well in, in the kind of work that we do to eliminate our legacy systems and replace them with modern software-defined networks, to change how we procure our response faster to changing requirements in a very dynamic uh, national security environment, to patch faster and respond faster. But as Admiral Kohler said, are we ready in the future? That's something that we don't want to take for granted. Uh, we're only ready if we continue to push ourselves in every way to continuous improvement on what we're doing today. I don't want to rely on the heroics that we often use to resolve the problems today. I want 
everything that we do to be muscle memory and to be automated so that we can respond faster. We have to exercise in ways that develop that muscle memory across the globe with all of our components and interagency and coalition partners. We have to develop uh, an agile workforce that embraces technological change and, and process change to pace our threats every day. So just when you think we're getting fast, we have to get faster. We have to be faster at developing better capabilities to meet emerging requirements in multi-domain warfare. We have to get faster at fielding those capabilities across the enterprise to get increased readiness at scale. We have to get faster at defending the Doden against our adversaries who are using artificial intelligence and machine learning against us already. We have to get faster at responding to incidents. And we have to get faster across the entire department in learning to fight through, even in a contested cyber domain, from the strategic level to the tactical level. Information power advantage delivers combat power advantage. So we have to improve what we do, and we have to continue working on that every day. Thanks. Okay, thank you. General Reynolds? Yeah, so, sir, thanks. You know, as the others have said, you've been, uh, you've, you've been here for a long time, um, and we appreciate your leadership. Colonel Shea, when I first met him, was uh, an early mentor of every Marine combo out there. So, uh, so, <laughs> sir, thanks. Um, so I, I'm not gonna- it Means so, he's getting too old. <laughs> he's a first. He's a first for a lot of Marine combos doing a lot of different things. Um, so I, I think I think where I'd like to go with this conversation is is um, not really to grade ourselves with respect to you know are we ready now, uh, but to suggest that we have to get better regardless of where we might find ourselves. Um, you know, our former commandant of the Marine Corps, General Neller, said uh, said something that has stuck with me, and I've repeated it over and over. In that, in that, in the information age, we're going to have to fight to get to the fight. We can no longer assume um, uh, the network will be there when we want it. We can no longer assume that space will be there when we want it. We can no longer assume that our weapon systems or our networks are free of the adversary. We can no longer assume. Um, the ability to pass intelligence the way we used to pass it in the in 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 previous um, engagements, and so that is really the the work that my team has been thinking about inside the Marine Corps is is how do you think differently across you know communications, intelligence, cyber, electronic warfare, SIGINT, information operations. How do you think differently? How do you operationalize those? How do you get them ready for a today fight? Because as General Osterman said this time last uh, yesterday, you know we might be in various stages in various domains in terms of you know you, you could find yourself in a phase three event in the information fight, and in a phase zero or phase one on the ground, and so um, there's this sense of urgency that I think we all need to have to say that we're either in our prep time or the fight has already started, right? In, in this idea of C5 ISR. And so the things that keep me awake at night are things like, am I gonna be able to train and retain the workforce that I'm gonna need? I don't think I'm gonna train them the way we're training them today. I think I gotta, I gotta create new partners. Um, new, you know, uh, Admiral Norton brought up that agile workforce. Um, we, got, we gotta value some, some folks out there um, in different ways in the future because they're gonna bring a skill set that's gonna be absolutely essential. Um, you know, in terms of uh, um, work that we've done inside the Marine Corps, just, just from a networking perspective, we knew that we had to fix governance, we fixed it. We knew that we had to clarify command and control of the network and we needed to treat the network as a, as a domain where we have an operational commander now that has the command all the way down in and through the MEF and the tactical networks because it is a single war fight in her fight. Um, and, and then things like, you know, how do we think about providing intelligence support in a detail environment where you're not gonna be able to pass big PowerPoint briefs and things. So how do you just think differently about this next fight? Um, so, those are the kinds of things that our team has been thinking about. Those are the kinds of things that we need help thinking through uh, with some of those things. Um, and, then, and then this idea of moving forward, moving away from a systems-based approach 
to programs to a services-based approach um, to how we piece together command and control capabilities in a way that we can be a ton more agile than we are today. We are not nearly as agile as we need to be um, with regard to the C2 support that we provide commanders. So, um, so anyway, those are just some some thoughts uh, about you know from a readiness perspective of what keeps me awake at night. So each one of the services, the <coughs> the leader of the service, whether it's the commandant or the CNO, are are have published some form of planning guidance or direction for the future as we go into the, into the budget. Could you talk a little bit about what will be different in terms of the vision that you have and how you support those strategies as we go forward? Is there changes that need to ma be made? Uh, are you comfortable where you are? Or do you need to take a little bit different look at it because of the way you see the operational concepts uh, evolving? And even you know with the Coast Guard, you're, the polar region is going to become more and more significant. You talked about 70 degrees south, well, we got 70 degrees north and all those areas up there. So, so how, do you, how do you see those areas that you have oversight and responsibility for, how do you see them evolving or developing? You know, just give us a rough sense of what that vision is, might be. And I'll start with you, uh, General Reynolds. Sure, sir. So, um, so General uh, Berger, new commandant this summer, you heard from him yesterday morning if you were here. He talked, in fact, the last thing that he said was that this information fight is the one that is the now fight. Um, so really the guidance that he has given to the force is all about um, the role of the Marine Corps in the next fight and, and specifically with regard to a Pacific fight. You know, um, you know, never in my 34 years have I seen a more closer um, Navy Marine Corps staff in, in the building. This is, this is all about naval integration for the United States Marine Corps. This is the Commandant of the Marine Corps saying to the Navy, wh what do you need from us? How can we help with sea denial, sea control? Following, following his planning guidance, uh, um, two significant priorities. One of them is naval integration. The other one was force design. Um, so force design is the Commandant's attempt to significantly change the formation of the Marine Corps and able to better support the United States Navy in a Pacific fight. So think sea denial, sea control. Um, the Navy has a construct called distributed maritime operations. Um, the companion concept to that in the Marine Corps is uh, littoral operations in a c contested environment. And as part of that, we seek to conduct expeditionary advanced based operations. So um, how do we provide um, friction, uh, confusion, um, how do we be where the adversary doesn't think we're going to be, how do we contribute to the sea denial uh, mission or the sea control mission of the United States Navy, um, how do we be agile enough to go do what we got to do and then keep moving. And so this, you know, yesterday uh, you heard a First Marine Division commander saying gone are the days of big static CPs, we're not building those anymore, we have to be fast. Um, and we got to be able to um, communicate um, um, with clarity on demand in a contested environment. Significant challenge. We need a single uh, identity so that our, our Marine commanders can be on the ship today, off the ship tomorrow, maybe back on, on the ship three days later. We're not good at that. That's hard. Um, so. That's kind of driving some of our thinking and the close partnership that we have right now with N2 and 6. Is there a particular capability that strikes you that you're going to need to be able to do that? So, so I think all the work that the department is doing, certainly under Admiral Norton's leadership with identity management and uh, sort of being in the cloud is going to be able to help. I think, I think one of the attributes of this next fight that, that we really have to wrap our head around is we talk a lot about joint all domain. We don't talk enough about global. This is a global fight. So building tactical regional networks is not necessarily helpful in a global fight. And yet that's what we're used to. And so um, that, that is a couple things to think about. Okay. Thank you. 
Uh, let me uh, add on to the, the conversation. Um, again, I thought it was um, very appropriate, uh, if not by design, uh, to have the sea service chief lead the discussions. It really set the tone. Uh, for those that hopefully got a chance to, to hear them speak yesterday morning, um, but you hear them speaking often with almost the same voice. Uh, from CNO Gilday's perspective, uh, his guidance clearly articulated in his FRAGO, his fragmentary order that he put out within the first few weeks of taking over uh, the Navy um, uh, last, late last summer, about the same time as the Commandant. Uh, and it was a frago, not a new strategy. It was, it was his reaffirmation that we were on the right course. All the guidance that was put out uh, in the design for maintaining maritime superiority 1.0, 2.0, and that we were on the right uh, course, and he was providing some vectoring. But it was number one mission for every sailor was readiness, readiness of the fleet. Uh, our budgets clearly uh, reflect that. Uh, and they talked at length about it in the panel in terms of where we are. Each one of the sea service chiefs kind of gave them a grade about how ready they thought they were, and they were on various places on that scale. Um, but clearly, um, our way ahead here, and the CNO's guidance was it was all about war fighting, war fighters, and the future Navy. Uh, but uh, to General Reynolds' comment was uh, right out of the gate, uh, it was going to be a different way ahead for the naval force, for the Navy and the Marine Corps, including our Coast Guard, uh, with the integrated naval force structure assessment, the INSPA. In the past, you would have called it a coordinated effort at best. Uh, this was integrated in terms of where we could collectively look to move ahead and, if necessary, make trades to, to recognize and have confidence that you could rely on capability delivered by, by your partners here. Uh, and that's the way it has been. Uh, I certainly agree with Lori's comments. The, in, the interaction uh, between her and I has been uh, constant, uh, and it has been the same across all the staffs in terms of how we move ahead. Um, our, our challenge is we have to be, you heard Admiral Davidson, we have to be interoperable uh, our job's up here to set the stage with the delivering the capabilities, and then it has to be hammered home with the type of constant training uh, that's going to allow us to find out where those gaps are and where do we need to move ahead. Um, so I, I think we've set the right stage on this, but we have work to do. Um, what's different uh, in this? Lots of discussion you're hearing, uh, you're seeing out in the press about the 355 ship Navy. Uh, Assistant Secretary of the Navy is even talking about you know, even numbers beyond that at, at some level. And it's not just a numbers game. It's going to be what is our future naval force going to look like that. More detail will be coming out, but you can certainly know that there are aspects like what is the mix of manned and unmanned look like. Um, the, the unmanned is, is almost a misnomer, uh, at least for today. It is almost more of a manned platform than it is with our, our traditional manned platforms. There's so much uh, manpower involved with operating each of the unmanned platforms that we operate today. Uh, we can't do business like that in the future. Um, those kind of unmanned mix into our uh, traditionally manned platforms has to be much more greatly automated, and it is going to absolutely rely on the networks, whether there are tactical warfighting networks, whether they interact with our enterprise networks, it's going to rely on them on a level that we have just not seen. And so that demand signal will continue to rise. Okay. Thank you. Admiral Manley, how do you see it from a Coast Guard perspective? So um, this nation uh, depends on about $5.4 trillion in maritime commerce. So the, um, the notion is that, uh, hey, we're, we don't own a lot of our capabilities. We rely on that, that industry capability that you folks represent. Uh, I certainly rely on uh, Admiral Norton and what DISA provides, who then reaches out to industry to secure those products and services. So my point is, is that our, from a whole of government and a whole of nation, our, our dependencies are, are also on that, that fourth estate that, that, that you folks and how you help us deliver uh, and, and protect the information environment that our maritime transportation sector uh, partners uh, rely on. So 
the, the notion is be able to uh, look, at, look at yourself, to be able to uh, assess the, the, your resiliency. So one of the, uh, the Coast Guard's uh, priorities is to be resilient in, in all things C5I. Having that, having that outreach to you um, will then uh, benefit not just the way the Coast Guard operates, but then the, how the Coast Guard continues to regulate and, and support the maritime transportation sector um, that we rely on for our, our nation's health and well-being. So, the, so as we assess the safe to sail of a vessel coming into a U.S. port, um, those, that ability to, to uh, work with the international community to set standards, that includes the cyber standards on board a, uh, a, a maritime uh, vessel that, that maybe have 15 to 20,000 TEUs coming into Port of LA Long Beach. Shut down that port for one day and, and the, the nation has a really bad day. So that discussion and that, that uh, the partnership that venues like this provide is that the solutions are generally there. Um, it's, our, it's our ability to, to collaborate and continue to um, uh, challenge ourselves so that we can build in that resiliency because it's not just what I have on a Coast Guard ship, that's great, but it's that, that whole of government, the whole of nation ability to, to remain resilient that uh, we need to have those conversations often and early. Um, I'd like you to be thinking about questions because I'll be turning them over to you for questions shortly. But before, uh, I've got a few more I want to throw out there. For, for Admiral Norton, um, the Indo-Pacific area is tremendously dependent upon DISA to provide and manage the, the, the long haul, the networks and the capabilities that are out there uh, in that part of the world. As these concepts evolve, you know, such as the Commandant's planning guidance and the things that we've talked about, whether it's uh, working with the Navy or the Coast Guard or the Marine Corps or, or the Joint Force for that matter, it, you know, the operational constructs are changing. Is there anything that DISA needs to do differently or needs to adapt to to be able to support those operational concepts? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, you know, one of the things that you, th if you think about from the joint world and what the, uh, the joint staff is pushing in terms of, of changes in strategies through the joint war fighting concept, and, and the work that they're doing of requiring the globally integrated exercises. And so as, Admiral, as uh, General Reynolds uh, said, uh, we don't have the, the ability, the luxury to really uh, uh, look geographically at a single theater. You know, the idea that you can set a, a theater and C5 ISR is going to work for a multi-domain joint operation and coalition operation just as false. It is setting the globe because our capabilities are around the world and, and so interlinked around the world. And uh, so the work that, that we do, um, ensuring the resiliency of the backbone has to be not just in the Indo-PACOM region, but around the world to support the Indo-PACOM region and the, the Indo-PACOM commander, regardless of where the, the uh, conflict might arise that's, that's uh, you know, coming from the theater or influencing from those adversaries. And uh, so the, the expectation for the globally integrated exercise is that we're not focusing on a single theater for a conflict, assuming that it's gonna be a regional fight. That's good for us because it forces us to recognize what our, our shortfalls are um, across each of the services, across the combatant commands, and the, the combat support agencies that have to support that. So the demand when, you, when you're doing multiple regional fights at, at one time or um, a, a regional fight spills over into other regions allows us to understand how we have to increase or rebuild our, um, our support plans for each of the combatant commands. And so we've been doing that over the last couple of years of rewriting each of our support plans for all of the combatant commands and ensuring that we have the, the resiliency of, of the backbone and all of the gateways that provide for support from the strategic down to the tactical level. I, I was at a conference uh, a few weeks ago and um, there were a lot of OV1s being put up, kind of the vision of what's going on. Um, 
But one of the things I didn't see in those OVs, those operational architectures at level one, what I didn't see was, you know, it could tell you how you could get a bomb on target, it could tell you how you could shoot, naval, uh, you know, uh, launch an aircraft from a ship or how you could operate uh, from the sea to the shore. But what I didn't see was the linkage to the, to the primary information sources, that being the intelligence community. So my question is, are you comfortable when you look at these operational concepts out there that the intelligence community is being brought into, uh, brought, you know, being embraced in these concepts? And number two, is the intelligence community um, gonna make, willing to make the adjustments they need to make? And I'm thinking like organizations like NGA, DIA organizations like that. Are, are they being thought about in these operational constructs or are they pretty much strictly a service perspective? Anybody want to add um, on to that? Yeah, I, I would tell you that, uh, we'll call them the three letter agencies, um, are, are completely in, in this understanding. You know, they, they, um, they have multiple customers, um, directly the combatant commanders, uh, they support the services in terms of where we are going and developing, and they're all about supporting uh, field and forces. Um, organizations like NGA, it's their forward deployment uh, kind of mentality is, is um, part of their DNA. So I'll say that they're, they're tracking along here, but I, I think you hit on one point I'd like to highlight. Um, you know, in the past they would talk, they said, you know, amateurs talk tactics and professionals talk logistics. Uh, I still think that's true. In fact, it's a whole other aspect of the increasing challenging to the, the kind of war fighting we, we uh, face today. Uh, but I think it's more apropos to say, you know, I wouldn't say amateurs talk tactics, but the professionals are talking about the information needed in the fight. Uh, it used to be the exclusive domain of the N6 or the J6 on your staff to some degree, uh, some degree your intel professionals. Um, there are no uh, we'll say traditional operational commanders out there that uh, don't have a much stronger appreciation. So in the OV-1s that used to be just covered with lightning bolts between things, uh, those are not taken for granted. Uh, okay. I think that's been an aspect uh, of a sea change from this recognition of this return to great power competition. Um, the kind of um, uh, operating constructs that now have been in place now for several years that we've been training aggressively towards. Uh, General Reynolds highlighted them, the distributed maritime operations and limit, uh, littoral operations and contested environments uh, from a, the naval force perspective. This has taken a fight from what we have been very comfortable operating at a tactical level. Uh, think of one strike group, one amphibious ready group, uh, but now think of multiple strike groups having to operate together, something that we have not had to do in the past. It's an easiest way for me to describe DMO and Loki, uh, just a whole uh, new level of, of complex of operations. This drives a whole different kind of construct in ter terms of how we bind those forces together and coordinate them. It's not massing, keep it, not amassing, amassing hardware, but effects uh, t uh, that, that's needed. To do that, you need to be able to communicate. Uh, and without the kind of capabilities that we've been talking about here for the last hour, you have no DMO, you have no Loki. And so it is, it is all about that kind of focus. When I talked about are we ready now um, in terms of our, our C5 ISR, and certainly in terms of uh, we're ready now, but we've evolved off the kind of architectures that were, that were tactically focused. The future is taking us to an operational level type of engagement. Uh, and back to a point, it's, it's, it's beyond operational. It's a global type of operation. That requires the kind of capability that DISA provides us on a backbone that has to be resilient because that's how we're going to work across the different campaign fronts that we need to be able to operate uh, in, at that level. So that's driving a whole different appreciation for what's provided here and a whole level of uh, of readiness that's uh, that's expected to be delivered from these capabilities. Okay. Anybody else want to comment on that? You know, one of the things I'm uh, struck by as I listen to the visions and the 
planning guidance and things and the discussions on some of the panels out here is the fact that you may have something going on in a particular theater that uh, is more has a kinetic base to it probably but at the same time you're going to be operating in that cyber domain globally um, any thoughts on on that and and I mean th what is what are the implications you know we, we we tend to focus on one or two things but if things through surrogates or whatever the case may be get stirred up any thoughts on what we have to do to be prepared to fight glo globally. You know, that the cyber people, you're fighting globally, and there's gonna be deception and everything else thrown in, misinformation, disinformation, and all these other things. Um, any thoughts on about how you deal with that? So I, I can just tell you that, uh, you know, the, the, the joint staff has gone through a couple series of uh, what they've called the globally integrated exercises with some uh, tier one linked exercises where, for example, you know, U.S. Stratcom, U.S. Spacecom, U.S. Cyber Command, all playing at the same time with one of the principal objectives of the exercise is to figure out how do you organize for this fight. And it's not intuitive, and it, and you, you really have to challenge all of the assumptions that we're used to with regard to war fighting, you know, um, you know, supporting supported relationships, um, the organizations inside, you know, so as U.S. Space Command stands up, how do you integrate space into the COCOMs? You know, we have DuraSpace 4, we have Space Coordinating Authority, we have Space IPEs, who's doing what to who, and if you're a service trying to figure out how do I make sure that the MAGTAF is gonna have the space it's gonna need, like who do you want me to talk to? So th these are conversations that we're having like right now. And, and oh, by the way, you know, do we really want the COCOM to have to worry about the space, the cyber, the EMSO separately, or do you provide that to them in a more holistic way? So all of these conversations are happening now, and, um, um, and I think we have a lot of work ahead of us to figure this out. Um, we need a lot more reps and sets. Um, and I think that there's opportunities for the services to continue to try to shape this um, so that we help the COCOMs get it right. But that's some of the work that's coming ahead of us just even this year, sir. I'm so gonna ask one more question, then I'm gonna throw it out, I'll <laughs> bring it out to you. So as you look at uh, how resources uh, uh, like such as R&D are being spent, is there a particular capability that you would like industry to focus on or set of capabilities? For me, it's all about getting faster. How, how do we automate more of the capabilities that we have today that are using extensive, exhaustive manpower to do them today and, and do that with artificial intelligence to understand what we're seeing with machine learning and automation of, of just the running of the networks and the systems. Um, you know, we've got, we can't man, manpower our way out of the problems that we have and the fight that we have. Like I said, our adversaries are already using artificial intelligence and machine learning against us in their cyber attacks. We have to continue to automate more and more of that in our operations and, and security, our patching, our defense, our responses in an automated fashion around the globe because, because like you said, you know, this is, is going to be uh, and is even today a global fight in cyberspace and we have to do that faster and industry is working on that in many, many different ways and we have to figure out how to bring that in um, to the department, to our, our enterprise systems much faster. How about from a Coast Guard perspective? Yes, sir. So I, I think we've got to be able to uh, have capabilities in that Dell environment. No kidding. Um, we're going to be disconnected at some times. We're going to have um, just poor communications at different times. We've got to, our systems have to allow us to continue to function in those sort of environments. And as we alluded to earlier, the, uh, the, the polar regions matter. So, and, you know, where R&D can happen, so I don't care, personally, as the Coast Guard 6, I don't care how I deliver information as much 
I need to be able to deliver information in all those environments, including the, the polar regions. The Arctic is, is heating up, um, literally and, and uh, figuratively. So the notion of be able to, how we transmit information in those sort of challenging environments, I was really pleased that we were able to work with the international community to get Iridium, a US firm, um, sanctioned as a global maritime distress safety system capability because they're, they're not a, a, a geo uh, provider. So they, they provide a kind of a stopgap capability up in, in, the, uh, in the polar regions. But I don't care if you deliver that information over uh, radio waves. I don't care how we deliver it. So the, the notion of providing connectivity in some of those very challenging environments, um, we need that. Okay, thank you. Uh, good, good afternoon, uh, Scott Kinner with the uh, Marine Corps Tactics and Operations Group. So I think this is probably headed towards General Reynolds uh, being a Marine person heading uh, with a Marine question, but uh, to Admiral Kohler as well. So the ground combat elements bid for success to help the Navy solve sea control, sea denial problems. Uh, the General alluded to it, we're doing a major force design change. Some sig really significant impacts on the ground community, especially when it comes to delivering fires that could help out with that problem. My question to the group is, um, when we say tactical, we're still talking, I understand we're talking about strike groups, but I'm talking about individual launchers. So when I look at what I, the ground combat community, can do for the fleet commander, it is literally us trying to plug into Composite Warfare Command, where a strike commander is saying something somewhere, and it's easy for uh, something to be launched off a ship, which is this big thing, but I've got individual launchers running around in places where it's are, they're isolated, hard to get to. That's why they're there, because you can put me there cheap and I can do things for you. So how are we, at the ground combat element, all my little people running around with all our little things, gonna plug into this larger naval tactical network? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I don't know, why don't you go solve that for me? <laughs> Going back to the last question, I think um, that would be a good place to start. I think, so right, so that's JADC2. That is joint all domain C2. So any sensor, any shooter, any Marine, any sailor, right? Um, so what is the Marine Corps contribution to that joint all domain C2? You know, right now it probably looks a little bit like a CAC2S, AFA TIDS like capability, but you're right. At the end of the day, what we want is that Marine Sergeant with his squad to be an extension of the joint force to be able to perhaps employ a national asset, a joint fire, a, whatever it is. Be a, just be a sensor, perhaps. Um, that, that is the challenge that we have. And I think, um, I think we can do this. I think, you know, we're, it's all about the data. You know, if we get smart about how we manage data, who needs to know, when do you need to know it, how do I get it to you? Um, I think if we focus there, we'll, we'll be able to get there. And I think we'll have some early success in that this year. Thank you, ma'am. I'm going to get an LLC set up and I'll get back to you. Roger. Yeah. <laughs> uh, a question, and General Reynolds, you just, uh, you just teed it up and probably took it home, but I'm going to ask Admiral Norton really a question about data as uh, how we manage it, how we protect it, how we move it, how critical it is in the all domain, um, I don't know, the data lake that's perfectly secured or not. So a question about data, just to make uh, your perspective on uh, protecting and moving and using data for the all domain fight. But then I, we, we, we're talking a lot about challenges. I'd like to hear a little bit of, you're happy that we're moving maybe one or two things from each of you in this way. You're making concrete steps you think that are attacking this problem that we're describing. So go positive, uh, maybe perhaps after Admiral, Admiral Norton talks a bit about data. Okay. Uh, so first of all, uh, let's think about uh, moving to a data-centric model um, for our, our systems and away from the network-centric approach that we've had for many, many years. And that, that means uh, assuming that our systems are going to be breached, our systems are, are always vulnerable and, and subject to that, but that doesn't mean that our data has to be breached. So how do we, how do we change what we do and how we take care of the network and the systems uh, so that the data continues to be pr protected in, in a way uh, across the, the, the world, wherever it's stored. Um, so when you think about uh, the fact that we are storing our data in different places, we're using our data in different places, 
uh, not necessarily uh, in servers that we can see and touch anymore, but much more in the cloud, uh, our systems as, systems as a service, and providing that service in a distributed manner means that we have to be thinking from the data-centric model out. And um, that, that's why uh, General Reynolds mentioned the identity management. That is so key to the design principles for that zero trust kind of a, of a, uh, a fundamental approach to data-centric protection, is we've got to have the, um, the identity management that is consistent and, and uh, reusable across the department, regardless of where we're operating, regardless of, of who we are, so that it's very clear um, what level of protection that data needs at any given time. And then um, understanding how we can best aggregate the data in a way that then we can use the very things that I'm asking you for, the artificial intelligence and machine learning in ways that, that give us the best um, use of the data for combat power. And so, um, so that's the approach that we're taking on, on data. We are, uh, are doing a lot of work to federate the data, um, you know, the data lakes that we have today and uh, continue to do that and share that, whether that's for cyber or, or other things that, um, for example, the Jar Joint Artificial Intelligence Center is doing in, um, in building out the artificial intelligence capabilities in the enterprise um, foundation that, uh, that, that we're, they're building out for the department. Uh, I'd like to add to the comment, and, and um, it was also part in answer to a previous question. So uh, I would say that the issue of data, uh, and I think Abel Norton has it exactly right, it, it's not the inhibitor or, or enabler, but it is a critical piece of going faster. Um, some of the wins that we have, we're, we're moving our head on certain areas that, where we need to. Um, in terms of uh, other comments made earlier about uh, the need for uh, automation, I, I would expand that to saying we need decision aids uh, in this complex environment at an operational level of war. We, we need that kind of capability, whether it's in a, in a uh, type of engagement or whether it's in our business processes, uh, the inhibitor is the data. Uh, we have tools that we've used to inform us better how to operate. We have tools of AI, but it's very focused and it's in limited areas because the data is not commonized. So uh, I won't say is the inhibitor, it's, it's one of them, uh, but getting that right will be uh, our ability to, to really move out with the kind of automation, decision aids, um, call it artificial intelligence if you like, uh, to move it out at scale is something that is much more meaningful for us. Yes, sir. Uh, Rick Easton, retired surface warfare officer. So my question is in the context of manpower and personnel in a C5 ISR peer competitor environment. My experience as a surface warfare officer was that given the, what I call the legacy manpower personnel construct, that in many of my systems I was unable to fully leverage the capability due to deficiencies in the manpower and the training, et cetera. Much progress has been made since I retired about 14 years ago, certainly in modeling simulation, et cetera. But when it comes to C5 ISR and still somewhat of a legacy construct as we detail people, do we in fact have the talent, can we retain the talent to challenge the, uh, the Chinese that have much more control, can keep people there much longer? We tend to hemorrhage a lot of talent. You know, some of our best people get out at you know, high year tenure, et cetera. What are the challenges when it comes to C5 ISR? What are your concerns and what would you change? Uh, let me take a dive into this because it, it is, uh, it's a very relevant question, um, uh, but it's one that, that comes up fairly routinely. We've heard it in discussions throughout the last day and a half. Um, for our information uh, base rates, our uh, information uh, Technologists, our ITs, um, our um, cryptologic technicians, uh, the, the, that kind of measure. Uh, in those rates, uh, we are manned, and in some cases almost overmanned, uh, above ratings. So in terms of attracting talent uh, and retaining talent, uh, I would never take that for granted. I would never say, I would say we're in constant competition to keep that going, uh, but our manning is healthy. Uh, now, in certain 
key areas, we find ourselves challenged in some key, certain key skill sets. And then we'll apply the right manpower type of skills, bonuses, and others to those specific skill sets. But um, we, uh, we're attracting the folks. We're uh, using them in ways that I think uh, allows us to compete with a different pay differential at some levels uh, to in, in a motivational kind of way. Um, but I think the, the, the core is, is, and that's not sitting on laurels, it's how are we using them and are we, uh, you know, unleashing them in the right ways. And, and this is where we find our challenging and, and challenges in our training pipeline. Our really, uh, ready relevant uh, learning, block learning, applying learning as it's needed to the job that individuals are going to uh, has a much greater flexibility and promise for us to be able to do that, uh, to make sure our folks are better trained for the jobs they're about ready to go into. Uh, and are trained at the latest tech, uh, technology and the latest tools and skills to get after. So um, it's, it's a fast moving field and it was all, that will always be a challenge for us. But I think we're structuring ourselves in the right ways. We are uh, also adjusting organizationally. Um, we have created a, uh, a cyber warrant, uh, warrant one position that allows um, a more junior enlisted uh, that want, as they are rising up into leadership roles, that want to stay technically focused in their skills. Uh, this is specific cyber. They can stay in that field uh, and stay focused um, and not be as much leaders as technical experts in our field. Uh, we've created a cyber warfare engineer that started out as something smaller, but now we'll, uh, is expanding that to, uh, to a larger force that allows us to develop those kind of tools and skills that we need to. So I think we're growing the kind of uh, organizational structure that allows us to keep and retain those key skills that we need the most or are most challenges in terms of retaining an, of a wider force. Um, you'll also hear the CNO talk about um, our IT rate. And Carol, this is the um, rate that Emil Norton leads as a community leader. Um, it's, it's the Navy's second largest rate and it covers, we ask them to cover a lot of turf. They cover expertise in our RF spectrum, which is increasingly critical in the type of operations that we're doing today. Uh, they also are, need to be experts on the uh, traditional networking ends of our business. And so I think we're working that through in terms of what that IT rating will look like as we go to the future. The CNO is clear that he says it may look like something very different than it looks like now, just because of the pace of where the technology is going. I, I don't know if you had any comments on IT ratings. Uh, no, but I do want to want to talk about the civilian wor workforce. So, um, in my you know my role in, at DISA and Joint Force Headquarters, Dode and the, the military come from the services, uh, but the civilian and my ability to uh, to recruit, train, and retain the civilian workforce, and all of you in industry that support me to be able to do the same thing with the right level of skill sets in order to meet the missions that are growing in. Uh, both capacity and capability, new types of skills, we have to be constantly on that and constantly working on that. It's the one thing that keeps me up at night more than anything else with all of the challenges that I have. It's do I have the right people to do the, the work that I have to do tomorrow? And, and are they properly trained in order to do that? Um, I will um, challenge you though on your term of, of hemorrhaging those people because the reality is that um, they will leave they will leave the military, they'll leave government service, but they'll probably stay in the field. And so they're not leaving us, they're, they're still supporting the nation in doing the work that we need them to do. So it's okay if some of them leave, if we train them really well and some of them leave and do, do this work from another part of the, the enterprise, we just need to grow the field. We need to grow that workforce from the bottom up. And so we've gotta do more work with, uh, with uh, young people in STEM education, getting them interested, getting them to understand what our expectations are and what they need to be doing, um, and helping them to realize how important it is to, to maintain eligibility for clearance when they become adults, so that they can be part of the workforce that we need them to be and, and grow that pie. Just, just one more thought on this, and I, I think that, I think you're spot on to worry about and to think about this, because I think if you want to deliver an information age force, then you have to train an information age force, right? And so you're, you've probably got to completely rethink the industrial age training model that we have, which is some of the work we're doing. We, we've got a pilot going on. Our Intel schools partnered with Amazon and Nova, Northern Virginia, um, 
to create a data science capability. So I send a couple, you know, 13 NCOs out to Nova. They 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 have a, an Amazon curriculum for data analysis. It costs me very little money compared to me having to hire my own con, you know, build my own curriculum that I, you know, I got to train myself first. So I think that's the way of the future. I think we partner with academia to train some of our Marines and sailors and to retain them. The Naval Community College that the Secretary is working on right now, some of those, uh, that curricula will be the stuff that Matt and Nancy and I need. It's gonna be in the IT field because what we know is that Marines and sailors want education. And so this idea of stacking certificates along the way to keep them in and to keep them you know, interested, I think the mission that we have is the mission that they want. We just gotta keep them fresh. Um, you know, just, just one more thought though, uh, with regard to the adversary that we might be talking about right now. Um, you know, they're not gonna employ their force the way that we do. We think about maneuver warfare, we think about pushing authority and permissions down to the lowest possible level and just let those NCOs get her done. Um, we think about the, the diversity of thinking that we want the force to bring to us. Um, the adversary locks up diversity in the northwest corner of their country. We have the edge with regard to manpower and, and how we train them and how we keep them. And you know, it's, it's, about, it's about pushing capability as far down as we can, just let them run. So now we're also doing, by the way, as, they're, as Marines are entering the Marine Corps, we are doing an AI-enabled kind of personality indicator to put them in the right MOS to begin with to make sure that we're, so we're trying to use science to put them in communities where they're gonna be best suited to do well in that. So, but I think to your point, we gotta continue to evolve this because manpower, our ability to retain these folks is gonna be our strength. I just wanna make a, we don't have time for a question here, but I'd just like to throw out a rhetorical thought here, so to speak, or a question. You know, when you think about all the technology that is coming with a rush over the next maybe five, six, seven, even some of it's here already, things like artificial intelligence, as these things mature, machine learning, uh, you know, potentially quantum down the road a little bit, the robotics, the internet of things. I think, you know, I think you're right, General Reynolds. I think there's gotta be another way of training because the, the schoolhouses can't possibly keep up and it's gonna get cost prohibitive to keep retooling every time a new, new technology comes out. So I think training is gonna be one of the Achilles heels going forward. And if my, my experience is one of the first things to get hit when budget cuts come down is the operational maintenance money, which includes in many cases training money. And if the force is not trained, we're not gonna keep them in, and those capabilities will never reach, uh, reach the capability they were designed to provide. So that has got, to, in my mind, as I walk around and I listen to different groups like this talk, there has got to be a re-emphasis or an increased emphasis, maybe a better way to put it, an increased emphasis on training. I think it's gonna be our Achilles heel if we don't. I thank the panel for the excellent answers. I appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, please thank our panel for a terrific presentation. We are going to uh, pause just a minute. Admiral, just a moment, just a moment. I wanted to uh, say several things. One is uh, this uh, actual uh, panel is worth uh, a unit of continuing education, and if you are interested in getting that credit at the back, you'll have some scanners, and you'll be able to uh, get your badge scanned for that. Um, but we are very happy that uh, we followed through Admiral Davidson gave us a lot of reality at lunchtime. And you can see the leadership on this panel dealing with that constructively, objectively, and fearlessly. Uh, a lot of people say they're losing sleep at night, but uh, I think uh, the opponent, as was wrapped up nicely, is equally concerned about the abilities growing inside our force, locking up diversity in the northwest corner of their country. I, that's, <laughs> that's a keeper. That's a keeper and really a remarkable It's true, country. tell the story. Absolutely. Uh, I'd like to make a presentation on behalf of AFSIA and the USNI, and that's a copy of uh, A Brief Guide to Maritime Strategy by James Holmes and an AFSIA bookmark to go with it. I also would point out that uh, 
we have that follows us here shortly, it doesn't end, it doesn't end here. We have one more uh, event that happens at 315, and that's the Women in FCA Appreciation Event with a keynote by Brigadier General Lorna Malak, Chief Information Officer of the Marine Corps. Uh, this has really grown to be a tremendous event, celebrating not just the women in FCA, but more importantly, the thought leadership that goes on across our force. It's a very, I, there's a reception that follows. I think you'll find it thoroughly enjoyable. I invite you to, it's down in the keynote area, and we'll deal with that. Uh, we'll see you down there. Thanks for being with us today. This is the last panel. We have an opportunity to address the group and say thank you for coming. Thank you for being here. Thank you for adding your energy and insight to the conversations we've had. Uh, we are happy to be uh, doing this yet again. This is the 30th year. The 31st is coming next year. It'll be a three-day event. It'll be in February. And uh, I'll look around now, and I know I'll see most of you back. So thank you so much, and thanks once again to the panel. Thanks. Thank you.